pero bueno, no hay problema. Okay, so uh, I was talking about the ejective scenario where this acts as a normal radio pulsar and then it spins down by magnetodipole radiation. And at some point, as the pulsar spins down, the matter can finally penetrate through the gravitational radii and forms a magnetosphere by interacting with the charged particle. However, this magnetosphere radius is still larger than the core rotation radius. And the system acts uh, as if it's in the propeller stage where it propels away than falling matter, but spins down at a faster rate. As the magnetosphere radius goes down um, with the spin down of the pulsar, uh, the corrotation uh, radius gets larger than the magnetosphere radius. And it is then when the system switch on as a conventional operating pulsar that we know. And the time scales for this uh, is about a million year and depends on the infalling accretion rate, the magnetic field of the neutron star, but also uh, several parameters of the accretion, for example, the relative velocity with respect to the neutron star, the geometry of the accretion, et cetera. However, we now know that there are at least six such objects which do not follow the standard evolutionary scenario. So you see here the names of the X-ray binaries here, the associated supernova remnants with them, and some properties of them, for example, the spin periods where we know it's a neutron star, the last two, uh, we did, uh, the neutron star spin period was not found. However, we believe the compact object is indeed a neutron star. And then by studying the supernova remnants associated with them, the age is were estimated. So the ages uh, range from about 6,000 years to about 50,000 years. And then by optical spectroscopic observations, the type of the companion was determined. So uh, most of them, the first five, are actually in the Magellanic clouds and are BE extra binaries with supernova remnants. The ones uh, marked in bold are the ones that I will emphasize in the talk and talk about in a little more detail. So let's look at the first case, which is uh, this B extra binary uh, called FXP1062 in the small Magellanic cloud. So um, here we see uh, um, optical radio and extra image. Uh, this is an oxygen tree uh, rich remnant uh, which uh, supports its core collapse nature. We also see a shell like structure in the radio. And this is a false color x ray image where we see the supernova remnant, but at the very near the geometric center, we see a bright and a hard x ray source which is this pulsar with a spin period of 1062 seconds when it was discovered. And by modeling the X-ray spectrum, uh, uh, one can determine the dynamic age of the system uh, to less than about 25,000 years. So this would mean that the pulsar managed to spin down at a value more than 1,000 seconds in 25,000 years, which is surprising. Uh, that In that case, it could either, uh, either be born with a very high spin period or a long spin period or had a very high magnetic field which uh, allowed it to spin down at a very high rate. The next one is another B extra binary supernova remnant association where we again see an X-ray uh, associated remnant in magenta uh, or in sign of the geometric center of the demise. And here is the newly discovered B extra binary. And again, by uh, studying the X-ray spectrum, uh, one can determine the properties of the remnant, especially the age, which is about 50,000 years. And uh, uh, we also see uh, signatures of enhanced oxygen muon magnesium abundance with respect to the LMC, uh, which supports its core, core collapse nature. And we also found the spin period of the system at about 570 seconds. So with the information of the determined spin period, uh, the uh, luminosity, which can be converted to an accretion rate, uh, one can uh, build a toy model uh, to see the evolution of the spin period with age. And in red, we see here for the given accretion rate, uh, uh, what magnetic field is required to reach the spin period of 570 uh, seconds at the age, determined age of the remnant. And this is about 4 into 10 to the power 14 watts. So here as well, you need a very high magnetic field neutron star or a magnetar uh, to be able to explain this. 
The next one that I will talk about is the most interesting of the lot because this is a much younger supernova remnant. Again, you see an F1 Newton um, false color image uh, where you see a prominent shell like structure and it also has a coincident radio shell. And again, there is a high mass extra binary almost positional coincidence with the geometric center. And in this case, uh, the supernova remnant is much younger. Uh, it can be uh, explained with the non equilibrium plasma model, and the age is uh, the upper limit to the age is less than 6,000 years. So, this is the youngest such object known. And uh, we also found indications of the spin period at about four seconds. So, this is a much faster spinning system because it's much younger. Uh, however, it is very difficult to understand how um, at how it switched on at, at an accreting system at 6,000 years. So in the simplistic assumption, if we assume that it has attained the spin equilibrium, the magnetic field is very low. But this is probably not correct uh, because a, a young system cannot be in spin in equilibrium at only 6,000 years. Uh, so there was uh, a proposition that maybe the system is still in the propeller stage um, and in this case if you again build the soy model uh, with the time and the spin period you see that uh, for the system to be in the propeller stage uh, you need a magnetic field greater than 10 power 13 bars there were also other works to understand how uh, you could explain such a system to be a free thing uh, one of the, the things that i found interesting was that it could be that this system uh, was born directly in the propeller stage and did not go through the ejector stage. And this could be uh, if there was an intense period of fallback accretion from the ejected matter from the supernova. Uh, and this could, for some parameters uh, that you see, P0 is the initial spin period of the neutron star, the wind velocity, etc. This, for some kind of parameter spaces or for certain parameter spaces, explain that this was born directly at the ejector phase and then reach the accretor stage uh, very quickly. And this does not uh, require an unrealistic value of the birth spin period. Uh, this is about at 400 milliseconds. And here, the magnetic field required is very typical to a neutron star, about three times 10 power 12 cups. So there was also um, an alternative proposition which says that here, the system went directly from the ejector to the accretor phase and did not go to the propeller phase. And in this case, uh, one requires a highly magnetized wind of the companion. And it has been uh, known, it has been found that uh, for massive OB stars, the, uh, the wind can be quite magnetized. And here, the, uh, the magnetospheric radius could be significantly smaller than the outspin radius and not typically 0.5 times that is believed in standard accretion theory. And here as well, one could explain that the uh, system went into the accreting phase at less than 10,000 years and did not need a magnetolite magnetic fields. Okay, so um, uh, next uh, I will show the work that is in progress in this regard. So I'm now systematically um, looking uh, for such systems where you have uh, supernova remnants and associated um, compact objects or X-ray binary systems. And of course, the uh, LMC is an ideal place to do the study as we also saw most of the objects that were found were actually in the Magellanic Cloud. And now with the Erosita outside survey, uh, the image of which you have already seen in the morning today, uh, we have covered the LMC uh, uh, in its entire X-ray extent for the first time. And uh, due to its uh, relatively nearby, well determined distances, the low line of sight absorption, and the recent star formation history, uh, where one expects a large population of hamasexual binary and supernova remnants, this is an ideal place to probe and find more such unique and interesting objects. And here I just show the image of the LMC, um, where you see. Uh, in here, a shell like structure with a hard x ray source, which is one of the B extra binary supernova remnants that I sh just showed. So, this is a flow chart just showing uh, what I typically uh, do. So, I look for hard x ray sources, um, positionally coincident with early type stars, uh, using information from optical and infrared. And I also look for uh, shell like or um, diffuse emission around. 
these objects uh, and I um, make sure these hard X-ray sources are not AGNs or some they have some obvious counterparts from uh, information in other wavelengths. And I also um, uh, try to understand what's the nature of this diffuse emission by looking at radio images and the continuum subtracted um, optical images, especially the sulfur 2 by H alpha ratio. And uh, well, from the evolutionary point of uh, view, we expect more B extra binary supernova remnants. So uh, these would be evolved supernova remnants. So we also expect to see low surface brightness, larger remnants in the LMC. So this is also another thing to look out for. And then uh, we would like to uh, follow up our candidates uh, of course, one needs to establish this is a core collapse SNR, look at the star formation history of the adjoining region, and uh, then look also at the compact object, look for pulsations, determine the spin period, the luminosity, infer the accretion rates, and then try to do the modeling. And of course, one needs to also um, have follow up optical spectroscopic observations to understand the nature of the companion. So, here I leave you with the summary. Uh, where I just showed some recent discoveries of supernova remnants, high mass extra binary associations that have opened a new window to this um, evolution of these systems. And uh, our goal is to find more such systems that challenge the time scales of the ejector and the prevalent phases that we know conventionally. And uh, one can also provide constraints on the magnetic field and the initial spin period distribution of neutron stars in this way. Uh, probe uh, ejector companion interaction. And of course, uh, we are doing the study systematically by looking at the Eros Theta data of the Magellanic clouds. Thank you. We have time for a quick question. Um, quick question. Um, when I think of uh, X ray binaries in and supernova remnants, I always think of SS43 and W50. Uh, is that, would that fit in with your picture? So SS433 has a black hole. Uh, yeah. at the... Yours are all neutron stars. Yes, oh. but of course, this, uh, I mean, in general, it's a high mass. Uh, SS433 is, remind me, it's a black hole with yeah, a yeah, it's, it's a yeah. Yes, so this also fits with the scenario, yes. But all of these have uh, neutron stars as a companion, so that makes it more interesting to probe more the properties of the neutron stars. Thank you so much. Thank you. So now, Margarita Karoska will tell us about symbiotic systems as potential progenitors of a fraction of supernova 1A. Hi, Margarita, you can start sharing your slides. Hello. Mm -hmm. One second. Uh. Can you see the slides? Uh, they're not in slide mode yet, but we can see your uh, PowerPoint. Oh, let's okay. see. It's not. Uh, let me just uh, stop share for a moment. Uh, share screen. Um. Let's see. Let me start here. You slideshow. Zoom, yeah. And then. Nope. Try view slideshow again. Oh, nope. View slideshow. Yeah. Let me go um, to um, this. Yeah, I had not had trouble before, right? Right. If you go to the lower left corner, you see the little uh, next to the four squares, to the right of the four squares on the lower left, all yep. the way on the lower left. Click that button. Yeah, uh, next one, the next one. The other uh, to the left, to the right, to the right. 
right there, yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> so I say new share. Maybe that's what the problem is. Can you see it? No, we cannot. Okay. Let me stop share one more time. I need, I know what it's happening, perhaps. Okay, share screen. I shared the wrong screen, that's why. Now? Perfect, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Hello, everyone, online and in person. Um, as um, Rudy said, uh, well, as the presenter said, this is a, a talk on symbiotic systems, potential progenitor of a fraction of supernova type 1A. But the um, main point of this presentation uh, is to emphasize the importance of um, understanding the characteristics of uh, in precursor environment of potential progenitors uh, of supernovae and in particular of this fraction of supernova type 1a uh, focusing on symbiotic systems. Symbiotic systems are interacting binaries consisting of an evolved giant, AGB star or supergiant, and um, a compact accreting source, which can be a main sequence star, uh, white dwarf, or even a neutron star. The, uh, Evolved star is losing its mass, a uh, significant amount of it, at the level of uh, at the level of um, ten to the minus six, ten to the minus five solar masses per year. It pulsates, and uh, through the pulsation, shock waves propagate to the upper atmosphere of um, these giants, OHB stars, uh, bringing material. And in the wake of the shocks, uh, dust is formed at about a couple of solar radius away. This dust is, dust is then accelerated by the radiation pressure. And uh, on its own, now uh, the dust is accelerating, the dust grains are accelerating the molecules and uh, the atoms forming a powerful uh, dense wind. A fraction of that wind is being accreted via accretion disk into the compact companion. The question is how much and can we bring enough material to the accreting companion so we can have eventually a deton detonation. Uh, symbiotic systems, uh, very interesting systems. They've been called nanoquasars because their morphology and spectra, especially X-ray spectra of some of them, uh, look very much like uh, some of the AGN, quasar AGN, and uh, of course, at vastly different scales. Uh, but they also have been invo invoked as potential progenitor for fraction of supernova type 1A. And that's why I will present in the, several of the future sl slides emphasizing also how important is the high angular resolution of, of multivalent observations from X-ray, UV optical to radio, and uh, a hydrodynamical modeling of this system to understand better what are the possibilities and potentials for them to be responsible, at least for the fraction of the supernova type 1A. So, um, that is uh, key to exploring the precursor conditions for this system being the progenitors. Um, symbiotic systems accrete mostly during their orbital uh, motion through wind accretion, which is relatively poorly understood. It depends on the property of the winds, orbital property, dynamics on the flow. The bondi hoel theory predicts that only 1% of the giant's wind is accreted. What I will show in the next, that has changed with the help of a high angular resolution observations and also with 3D hydrodynamic modeling. And uh, we have a, a different view of how much mass can be accreted. Um, 
we focused, and here I will present examples of several nearby symbiotic systems, which are unique laboratories for studying the wind interaction and accretion because they're nearby and can be resolved using high angular resolution and many wavelengths. And um, I will present some model results for those and recent results. Um, the first hint that they are, even in these detached systems, where neither of the components is filling its Roche flow, and there shouldn't be a flow. Even in these systems, there is a flow, is the Chandra observations, ACCS observations in 2003, where in this Myra AP system, one of the um, detached systems where the components are the furthest away from each other, we have the Myra type star on the right, the giant, and on the left, we have the accretion white dwarf, uh, about 70 AU separated 0.5 arc seconds, it's not arc minutes, arc seconds on the sky. Even there, you see the bridge between the component, there is a flow. That was a hint and started uh, further observations and also modeling, which I will show in the next few slides. Uh, a few months later, the HST observations show similar thing. And then with um, my then students, Miguel de Valbora and colleagues, we did 2D and then later on 3D hydrodynamical models, trying to see whether we can make it flow, whether we can make a Roche lobe like overflow that will bring more mass to the companion. And indeed, the results show that uh, the accretion rate can be uh, at least an order of magnitude higher than predicted from von de Hoel. Uh, when we have a closer system like 10 AU separated, which I will show a couple of examples after this, the 3D hydronomical models show that the accretion on the left is the giant, to the right is the um, white dwarf, it's about an order of magnitude or more higher onto the white wolf and forms a spiral flow by losing the material that is not accreted on the wolf, uh, dwarf in the closed circumbinary uh, region. So this is very important. If you can dump enough material with time, maybe if you have a massive enough white dwarf, you'll be able to detonate it. So even in detached binaries, Focus wind equation with Roche lobe like overflow is orders of magnitude higher than predicted by Bondi Hoa. One nearby at about a couple hundred parsecs uh, symbiotic with about 10 uh, astronomical units separation between the components. It's CS Sigmi. These are Chandra HST relay observations. Red is the soft emissions from Chandra. The central region where the binary is is not resolved. But in the red, we are seeing the jet and the counter jet. Similar in green is the oxygen free uh, 507 line uh, from HST showing the jet and counter jet. And in blue is the VLA. It's all, this is the one arc second um, scale. And we see a place C3 where the jet is slamming into pre existing circumbinary shells. The velocity is about 1,000 kilometers over a thousand kilometers per second of this jet. Uh, because of the high angular resolution of Chandra, uh, uh, we are able to separate the central region, which is in black, the accretion, disk around the white dwarf, and we can see the red in red is the spectrum of the counter jet in red. I would not dwell on this, just just a note of this uh, six to seven kilo electron volt uh, ion lines, including K alpha. Um, another one that it's been a, uh, sorry, <laughs> Rudy's, one of Rudy's favorites, and this is the Chandra press release. And this was recently, uh, recent image that uh, Rudy worked on it. We see in red optical from a previous uh, powerful explosion is this symbiotic system. Uh, the X-ray is in blue here. The scale here between in the red big uh, ellipses there and uh, where the jet is expanded, it's 
uh, number of arc minutes. But what we are interested in, in this red square in the middle, which is about few arc seconds from the central region where the jet is forming collimated. Why? Because all, although we have much more matter uh, accreted on the white dwarf, we need to know how much it can retain and how much is ejecting in these powerful jets and outbursts. Um, I will show you um, uh, and combine image from uh, Chandra and HSD from observations 2017, 2018. And we have also VLA <laughs> observations. In red, you are seeing the soft emission. The blue is medium hard emission. The hard emission is in the center. You see it in this white part. And uh, the green is again uh, the uh, uh, HS3, HST3, F3730 uh, emission. So it's very complex. The jet is very powerful. There is jet and counter jet and it's processing. Now, the normal behavior of the main star, I mean, of the red star in this system, which is Myra type star is that it pulsates with a period about 380 days. And the pulsation is pretty regular, except in the last three years, something happened. We see tremendous absorption, as you'll see at the last three light curves here, portion of the light curve, uh, last, three, last three cycles, tremendous absorption of a couple or more magnitudes in the optical. So there was an outburst in the system and we have been following it closely, uh, including a proposed, uh, including accepted proposal for recent for new observations with uh, Chandra, with HST, VLA, in infrared, we are IRTF, uh, SWIFT, and so on. And the results that are coming are absolutely fascinating and will be presented in several upcoming papers. The white dwarfs in um, this three examples of symbiotics that I uh, mentioned are probably less than one solar mass. Uh, however, there are symbiotics with a mass that is above one solar mass and um, probably enough above one solar mass, uh, 1.3, that if you can spoon feed it, as one of our colleagues in the audience probably remember the expression, maybe you can put enough material for it to be able to, to eventually explode. Um, MWC560 is a bit farther away, uh, one, two kiloparsecs away. The estimated mass of the white dwarf is 1.3 uh, solar masses. It had gone through several outbursts. The International Ultraviolet Explorer observed the spectrum in 1990 showing uh, wide lines uh, indicating speeds, jet speeds of 6,000 kilometers per second. I mean, this is tremendous. Lucy et al. published that recently. Uh, Vina Kashyap, uh, myself and um, others, we um, analyzed the data from 2016, ACS, and um, the, the, the convolved image shows that there is a jet, as you see it, in the southeast quadrant within one arc second of the center. We got new observations with HSD XMM and, of course, Chandra, and we are, on, we are toward the end of the analysis of data preparation of a paper. The jet is the way it was interpreted that we are see, looking down the barrel. Well, if we are looking down the barrel, it would be interesting how to explain that we are seeing jet in either in projection or actually there are multiple jets and the jet is processing. So um, symbiotic binaries with white dwarf masses above one solar masses could be potential progenitors of a fraction of supernova type 1a. And uh, it's really worth continuing these studies and modeling, including multi-wavelength high angular uh, resolution observations and uh, also 3D hydrodynamic modeling to explore the precursor conditions uh, and environment of potential, these potential progenitors of a fraction 
of supernova type 1a. Am I okay with time, Rudy? You're out of, out of, out of time. Okay. <laughs> Oh, hi, sorry, I can't. We have time so, for one question? Anything online? Uh, no question online. Just a quick comment on the on the Mara um, work that you're, that you're showing. And I mean, I think like some of this ample evidence by now that we don't, we have, Lots of statistics that 1As do not have a red giant companion, just as an FY, maybe as a comment. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think they're great systems, but I, I don't necessarily think they will lead to at least normal 1As. It's worth exploring because uh, we, what we learned in the works of the last years, that we really understand very little about how creation is done. And how yeah, this is true, but work. We, we on there, there's no, no red giant companions. Right. It's worth it's worth continuing the exploration. So, yeah. I mean, what, what the test the, the, the test data shows is there's I mean even if it does destroy we would see it in the test data that was shown yesterday. Well, I got five. I got five. Simulation. They say still Anyways, we can, we can take this off. Yeah, yeah, right. Move on. Um, okay, so next we have, well, you can, have two. Can you stop sharing slides, please? Uh, yep. Yep. Stop sharing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do I need to hear your microphone? You don't need to. Mm -hmm. don't know. Yeah, I think it's okay. So is this the floor? Uh, that doesn't work for full volume, just for laser volume. Okay. Laser volume. It's the middle one. Yeah. Uh, you'll have to use the arrow key here. Use arrow key? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to talk about the supernova remnants and their and their progenitors in the large imaginary cloud. I've been doing the large imaginary cloud since 1978, so it has been a long time, and it's a lot of fun. Okay, so I'm going to talk about five little topics, okay, but not all. Uh, I just list five things, five kinds of funds we can have in the large magnetic cloud. First is to uh, diagnose type 1 supernova remnant. Um, these are things you already know, but, but it's, it's kind of like oldies, the songs you can hear it again and again. So, so for the young type 1 supernova remnant, you can use the bomber dominated shell to diagnose them. Kind of like, uh, so here you have the H, H alpha shell and you have X ray emission inside. And if you have this bomber dominated shell because the 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 collision of the shocks goes into a partially neutral material. Then of course you can use the X-ray, the X-ray spectrum of the supernova ejecta, and you can look at the from the spectrum, you can look at abundance and look at the, the ion emission and then all the all these uh, magnesium silicon etc. these lines. And that's the diagnostics for type one isphone remnant. The core class one remnant can be identified the, the oxygen abundance and 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 that's the interstellar medium. So actually Actually, actually, spectrum of the supernova reject is a really good diagnosis for type 1A. These are for sure. So these two, these two uh two methods are really, I can say maybe 100 percent sure it's type 1A. Then if you're lucky, you can have a supernova light echo, and then the, you can take spectral light echo, then you can still get a, um you can still confirm it's a type 1A. So the macho, macho surveys find all these light echoes of, of the supernova remnants. And so you can find their, their ages and take spectrum of their light echo, you can confirm it's type 1A, no problem. And then the next one is that you can look at the, the stellar and interstellar environment. This is kind of like a flaky, you know, it's not 100% sure, but it's kind of like a, when you have not, nothing better to do, uh, this is the, the best you can do, right? So in that, this is, 40, 40 years ago, you know, we, we count for the graph of place, count the blue stars, and that's very ancient, you know. Then if you go to a CCD, uh, CCD photometry, you do star formation history, then these are, you know, modern methods, they like look at star formation history, then for, for the core class ones, you can see, oh, indeed, you know, star formation peaked up like a few million years ago. So these are type 1As. Okay, so from, from these methods, especially the, the uh, Bomber dominated remnants and bomber dominated shells 
and uh, X-ray spectroscopy for the supernova ejector abundance method, we have all these confirmed type 1As in the large magic cut. So these, these five, the, the circles around squares, these are the bomber diamond. They have bomber, bomber, bomber shells. Okay. And you can see the bomber shells up to about, about 30 parsecs in diameter. So beyond that, you don't see that anymore. So this kind of evolution effect, okay? So for the, uh, the X-ray spectroscopy of the supernova ejector, it can go up to about 45 parsecs in diameter. But beyond that, it's not they disappear, okay? It's because we don't detect anything, any type 1A to be, be beyond that. So I think maybe it's affected to about 45 parsecs. For the large one, it's so so large and evolved. You know, you can can probably you can probably cannot tell the difference anymore, right? So this is kind of like roughly kind of like a scale. We can remember that. So the second thing is again, you can use so the large magic car is a good place to search for the progenitors of type one supernova remnants. So whether whether the type one supernova was single single degenerate or double degenerate, and this. LMC is a great place to search for them. Okay. And I refer this to Terry's talk um, tomorrow morning. Okay, so I'm not gonna talk about this. I'm just saying it's a good topic for the large magnetic cloud. Now I'm gonna move on to the so that was type 1A. Now let's go to core class mineral remnants. I'm gonna talk about something really old, so the young people probably don't even know about these references. Okay. <laughs> so this is um okay, type six. NCT3A, that's a beautiful swimmer remnant. It's in the H2 region, in this H2 region, NCT3. NCT3, this H2 region is photo ionized by the OB association called LH83. So there's an OB association here, and here's the swimmer remnant right there. Okay. It's the first supernova explosion in this OB association. If you look at the H2 region, it's very quiet, and it's just like a, just a classical H2 region, but then there's a swimmer remnant right there. Okay. So this is back in God, 1980, 42 years ago. Some people are to find out even 40 years old. So 40 year, 42 years ago, Reggie Dupont and Sydney Vandenberg, so they look at the stars in the H2 region. They find that the, the most massive stars are probably about 30 solar masses, okay? So the progenitor of the supernova must be great, must have masses greater than about 30 solar masses. But in those days, you know, 1980, uh, Sid Vandenberg and Stretchy Dupont most likely they use photographic plates. Okay, so it's an ancient <laughs> technique. Then, uh, 15 years later, and Sally Uli use a use a CCD images and get get back to the country. And she made this beautiful HR diagram. So here's the main sequence. These are evolution tracks to to post on it. And it's kind of confusing here. I drew this line here. Okay, so this is the evolution track of 40 solar mass star. You look at the main sequence here, this is one star, and here's another star. Okay, so this star it must be greater than about 40 solar masses due on the main sequence. So the progenitor of the supernova of the supernova must be greater than uh, maybe about so this is 40, probably above above it. So maybe 45 solar masses. Okay. So it's a really massive star. So they explode and got that. So now we get we get to okay, this is all right. So here's a here's another case. So here's this OB association at LH75. And, and there's a the ASCAP the, in the radio, you can see the nice, beautiful radio shell here. It's a swallow remnant. And there's also X-ray emission, corresponding X-ray emission that is in So this these contours are just the X-ray contours. And you look at up range, H alpha A, you see it's solid, you don't see any shells. It's a shell that is it's swimming remnant, okay? So we look at the stellar content. So you see, it's an OB association. We assume that the OB association, all stars are born at similar time. If it's not on Tuesday, but maybe Tuesday and Thursday or Wednesday or something like that. All right. So we look at the, the stellar content. We look at all these stars and we plot them on the HR diagram. Okay, HR diagram and plot all these evolution traps of stars. You can find them the rough math. Of course, you know, real math will say, you're crazy, you can't do this. You just use a colorimental diagram to turn massive stars. You're crazy, okay? Yes, crazy. For stars more massive than about 30 solar masses, you cannot do this. You have to get spectra and do this uh, analysis. But for stars that are like 10, 15 solar masses, it's okay. These are B stars. B stars are not crazy, okay? 
these are the nicely behaving stars. So, so do the comparison, you find that the cluster, okay, this open source in here, right inside here, all the stars, nothing, no star is greater than about 15 solar masses, okay. And the, the center of supernova is right here. So it's so close to the cluster, to the to the core of the open association. So we think, and there are, there are stars outside, there are more massive stars outside. So apparently the star formation can maybe propagate the outward. So the closer the core that has the old has the, the is born first, and then the star formation propagates the outward. So these stars are a little bit younger than the stars inside. So in, in this core, the massive stars are have already slowed it. And this star is so this supernova was so close to the core. So the mass was probably about 15 solar mass or so. So it's roughly, okay, you, you can have plus minus two or something. So it's a roughly, it's a, it's a not very massive, massive stars, okay? So you can you can do this kind of thing for a lot of smaller remnants. So that's kind of fun, you know? You, you put stars together with the smaller remnants. It's wonderful. Okay, now we come in with two puzzles. There are two big puzzles. This is something that puzzled me for a long time. So these, these two solar remnants are crazy. This is type one and this core class. Why are they together? Why are they colliding each other? Oh, and the, the large remnants are so large. I mean, why are they separate? No, they, they don't belong together. Why are they so close together? You look at the actual image. And you look at the, this is the HFC image. You look at it. Mm, I don't see any circumstantial medium. I don't see any knots or something. There's no thing. It's just, it's a, it's a small remnant. And that's a type 1A. That's a nice one up here. And that's core class. So I don't understand. Okay. And there's the next one. This, this one is also crazy. There's a super bubble. And there's a shuijin. There's a type 1A here. This is an A9. Fred's a baby. <laughs> and this is HFC image. You look at this, is that, you know, this is so different from the, the type 1A super right? the bomber dominated remnants you, you, you love. You know. And how do they compare to the the bomber dominated remnant you love you 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 love so dearly? Okay, so this is the O five four eight bomber dominated shell right here, fifteen parsec, one Archimedes scale, one Archimedes. You look at them; they're not too different. Okay, in, in terms of size, so these two are just slightly larger. They're larger, okay, larger than this. But you look at them, totally different. So what are these two type one A's? What's your progenitor? I don't know. It puzzled me a great deal. I don't lose sleep, but uh, it puzzled me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, okay, now come to the last topic, okay? So, so now we, have, we know type 1A supernova remnants in the Milky Way, in the large mansion crop. We thought, hey, we're going to M33, okay? Go to one step farther. We want to go to places where no one's been there before. All right? So, so I look at all the the bomber dominated the one A is in the large energy club. Uh, they're all about 30 parsec or smaller, and they're all brighter than about 5 times 10 to 35 Earths per second in x ray. Okay, this is virtual S of the x ray. Okay, so we use this criteria. We go to M33, we look at the x ray source catalog. Okay, we look at x ray source catalog, we select all the thermal x ray sources greater than 5 times 10 to 35 Earths per second, then we go look at their H alpha image. And then look at the alpha two and O three images to search for each of our bomb uh, down these shells. Guess how many we got? Zero. Not a single one. Zero. Okay. Zero. All right. M thirty three has zero. M thirty three. The, the in terms of size and software history, etc., they are not inferior to LMC. Okay. But LMC is fine. M thirty three has zero. <coughs> Okay, and then we look at the, the Milky Way. Okay, the, the, the Milky Way, so it was Kepler and Tycho here, and 106 here, and there's another one here, and R086 here. Okay, now let's uh, look at the, the picture. So the bright ones, they are mostly thermal, okay? So Milky Way has two of them, LNC has five, M33 has zero. And then look at the fainter ones. The fainter ones are mostly non-thermal. And the Milky Way has three, LNC has zero. M33, we don't know, we didn't search that. So you look at these numbers. Is this a small number of statistics or does it tell us something real different, something really different among the three galaxies? I know some people say, ah, oh, it's Mac effect. Well, that's crap, I don't, I don't know. 
<laughs> so, so you can tell Ethanol and LMC are so much fun. So I have a great time. Okay. Um, so in your plot, when you show the extent of velocity versus the size, where you put the um, the uh, the dotted lines. Yeah. So since you only have five objects, do you know <laughs> if the line has to be shifted? This no, no, no. And this is a, these are bomber down -native. So this vertical line marks the the end of the bomber down -native remnant. So th these are these are also bomber, these are also type one A's. They don't have bomber shells. Oh, okay. So these are so these are older. So the bomber down shell will disappear at one point. But yeah. earlier, I think when you had the same plot, uh, you had one more vertical line. I think uh, again to the line yeah. That's the... so. These are the bomber. No, these are type one A's. So there's nothing beyond that. So this is about forty five parsecs. So things that are bigger, they may be the even though they eject a kind of dispersed and you don't see you don't get you get don't get to see the signatures anymore. Maybe they could, I don't know. Very naively, this valve shells is in the forward shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then it's a property of the medium where this mm -hmm. event occurs, not of the event itself. If everything is ionized. There will be no bomber bomber shell if that's in the diamond. Uh, these four, these five guys, okay, and one three one o three b. It's also near some kind of super bubble. Near has some has some ionizing fluid around, but it still has a bomber shell. M thirty three. The interstellar media is not that different from <laughs> yeah, but I mean locally. You know, so it's local. circulation and things that we cannot control locally. Well, it's it's in the middle of nowhere, right? This it's like, oh, it's like five. It's like they had zero. Five and zero. <laughs> the, the ratio is infinity, you know? <laughs> 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 Well, I mean, you know, I, I love the I love the symbiotic remnants. I think you you, you showed them to me. You discussed them. Did you ever find out, like, you know, is there a way to find out if they are actually just like by random chance next to each other or not next to each other by like, they had, offset? They had very similar radio velocity. So the next thing we're gonna do, I just talked to each other is we're gonna look at the serial content, look at the serial population you need it. So we are getting more and more sophisticated. We can tell that throughout the years, you know, through the years. I'm getting more and more sophisticated. <laughs> I'm learning stars and I've been coming into diagrams and, and yeah. So there's a way to you're saying like no, but I mean, can you measure the velocity of these remnants really that precisely? Oh yeah, yeah. In the paper, uh, Williams et al. We have we do have the shell spectrum of both both remnants. The systemic velocity is very thin, almost the same. So the the, the lines are really thin. The... Oh, we see the equation. Both 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 the remnants are expanding. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the yeah. last talk of the day is by Sumit yeah, Sari. And he'll tell us about supernova progenitors from supernova remnant and stellar population surveys in the local city. Okay. Can they hear me if I don't? Uh, they they can hear you from this mic, yeah. All right. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Sumit. Uh, I'm happy to give the last talk today. Uh, and so I will be talking about what we can learn about progenitor models uh, from supernova remnant and stellar population surveys. So <clears throat> we already talked about this quite a lot, but I'm just gonna uh, recap. So uh, one of the important questions about type 1As is, you know, what is the companion star of the white dwarf that is exploding? Okay, so we know that it's a white dwarf that's exploding, but, you know, is the white dwarf accreting from a main sequence red giant star? Is the white dwarf merging with another white dwarf? 
Uh, you can ask questions like, is, is the white dwarf exploding at Chandrasekhar mass? Is it less than Chandrasekhar? Is it more than Chandrasekhar mass? Does it need to spin up, spin down? Does it uh, merge during a common envelope? There's all sorts of questions we've been asking for decades and there's arguments for and against all of these things. But really the uh, takeaway is that there is no consensus as to which model or combination of models explains all of the type 1As uh, that we see in the universe. Uh, so we already heard about this quite a lot. We're going to hear about this tomorrow, so I don't want to belabor that point too much. Uh, moving up the mass ladder, uh, we have a generative problem with massive stars. Okay, Specifically, do all massive stars explode? So if you look at, for example, the progenitor masses of uh, nearby supernovae, most of them are clustered below 20 solar masses. And that is not what you expect from the initial mass function, right? So, so what's going on? Now, if you ask some people, they're going to say that, well, you're not measuring masses correctly. Some people are going to say it's dust. Some people are going to say, you know, this is not a statistically significant problem. But there is a fraction of the community that thinks that this is a physical uh, thing going on. Here. Namely, the most massive stars are, uh, or the higher up in mass you go, the less likely you are to explode. And uh, one of the best observational evidence in favor of this is N N6946 which was a 25 solar mass red supergiant that effectively disappeared uh, on the time scale of a decade. So is this a universal phenomenon? Is this happening to all massive stars? So many people study these things in different ways. My favorite way is to study them uh, using something called the delay time distribution, which is defined as the supernova rate per mass of stars as a function of time delay. So imagine if you have a cluster of stars and imagine that they all form at the same time, this cluster is going to produce supernova over time, you know, from star formation. So that's effectively what the delay time distribution is. And this is powerful because different progenitor models will have different delay time distributions. So the time scale on which the progenitor evolves, the number of supernova you will get from the progenitor as a function of time, that is very sensitive <clears throat> to the physics of your model. So for example, these are some example type 1A DPDs. Uh, DPD is delay time distribution. Uh, this is from uh, Medic and Sadal. And uh, these are based on binary evolution models. So there's parameters related to mass transfer, common envelope. So always take it with a grain of salt. But most modelers agree that in this uh, red accretion scenario or the single degenerate scenario, you cannot produce supernova or you have trouble producing supernova uh, beyond a certain uh, number of giga years. And this is because you're starting to go to lower and lower mass secondaries, and the mass transfer process to the white dwarf just becomes inefficient. In contrast, the merger double degenerate model, this can go all the way you know, up to the age of the universe, because it depends on how far apart the white dwarfs are, and it just takes time to merge uh, up to supernova. So you know, if we can measure this, we can actually validate these uh, models. And you can play the same game with core codes, right? This is a model we see by uh, uh, Zapartos et al. 2017. Uh, there's also models by BPAS. And, as, and effectively, you get what you expect, which is you know most of the core collapses go off between three and 40 million year delay times corresponding to massive above eight solar mass. And so with this, you can ask uh, the question, uh, is there significant signal in the DPD less than 10 million years, which corresponds to a mass of more than 20 solar masses. So is that consistent with stars disappearing? Because if stars are disappearing, you shouldn't have a signal over here. Uh, you can also, uh, there's an interesting prediction from these binary population models that uh, the core collapse uh, supernovae can also come from these four or five solar mass stars in the form of stellar mergers, okay? So we heard about, you know, luminous red nova and ILOTs and all that. So, you know, this, this merger thing happens in the universe. And so these could be, also producing core collapse. Is that, is that a real thing? Uh, so really we want to measure the late time distribution so we can compare them with observation. And the way you do this is uh, you typically do it with supernova surveys and the equation uh, goes like this. The star formation history involved with the DPD gives you the number of supernovae that you see today. Okay, so what this means is that uh, imagine in a galaxy, stars are forming throughout time. Those stars are going to produce supernova over, over a certain time delay. And so if you integrate over cosmic time from today or from Big Bang to today, you will uh, get a certain number of supernova. And so you basically invert the problem. 
Okay, so you can measure star formation history. So suppose you're doing a supernova survey, you get star formation history of each galaxy from its spectrum. Uh, you can just count the number of supernova per galaxy. And then you ask, what is the DTD such that the star formation history of every galaxy is consistent with the number of supernovae in every galaxy? And so this has been done numerous times uh, with the type 1a supernova. You know, back when type 1a supernova was all the rage, you know, uh, and these are all measurements that have kind of, well, I mean, it still is, but you know, <laughs> back when gravitational waves were in the thing. I mean, so uh, most of these measurements have kind of relaxed uh, into this one over T uh, type form. And this was one of the first really strong evidences that the single degenerate model or the accretion model uh, is probably not producing all of the type 1As in the universe. And there are many other corroborating evidence uh, like Wolfgang was talking about uh, that also kind of works against this accretion scenario. Okay, so, and, and the powerful thing here is that you are able to constrain the progenitors for the entire population. Now, it's not just one or two objects. You, you can say something like, what is the percentage of the supernovae that are consistent with progenitor model X or progenitor model Y or Z and so on. There is a major caveat though with doing this with supernova surveys and that's that the star formation histories are based on integrated spectra. So by default, you're gonna be dominated by the youngest and the brightest and the most massive stars, okay? So eventually you want a correct census of the actual mass distribution versus age. You just can't do that with spectrum, okay? If your galaxy is too far away. So really the alternative, the only alternative is to look at the local group galaxy. You have resolved stellar populations. You can literally count the number of blue stars and red stars, and you can get a much more accurate star formation history. You know, we're gonna pretend that, you know, binary stellar evolution models don't exist. Uh, everything has been done with single stellar models, but, you know, the data is much better in the local group. And so essentially you do the same process again. You get star formation histories from resolved star. You get, uh, you don't have supernova, but you have supernova remnants. You know, they did come from supernova. Uh, so, and then you just solve for the DTD. And so this was uh, for the first time shown by uh, Carlos uh, and Dan Mouse that yes, you can do this with supernova remnants and you get what you expect. Okay, you have this big signal at 10 million years coming from core collapse, should be coming from core collapse. And then you have the signal at 100 million years and then some upper limit at 10 million years, which seemingly could be the type 1a uh, signal. Uh, of course, later, uh, this was kind of when the Zaparcus et al. model was published, this was compared with the core collapse VPD. And something interesting came out, uh, which is that this 100 million a year signal is actually uh, you know, a couple of factors higher than what you measure from 1A uh, surveys. And uh, now there's a lot of systematics here, uh, but you know, if you take this at face value, this could be evidence for that delayed core collapse signal uh, that we were talking about. So if you remember uh, Katie's talk yesterday, uh, she was talking about uh, star formation histories around small Magellanic cloud remnants. And some of these objects actually have 100 million year populations around them. So, you know, this, this, this could be real, but, you know, we would like to know this, we would like to measure this better by, you know, maybe breaking this bin up into two or three bins. Uh, the, the original question that I asked, you know, about the explodability, you know, do all massive stars explode? Uh, that can't quite be explained by this one single bin. I mean, it is consistent with uh, the prediction here, but it's it's just too broad. Um, and, and this will be nice to know because, uh, again, in Katie's talk, we saw that uh, if you look at the progenitor masses in the LMC, those are much higher than the masses in M31 and M33. So, you know, is that is that actually real? Is that, uh, you know, an actual IMF-related thing or is that, uh, uh, you know, some other kind of order? Uh, and then uh, the 1A DTD upper limit, this is, uh, this is an upper limit, it's consistent with the measurement, but you know, we would like to know if there is actually a signal. Um, so again, uh, this is, uh, you can kind of get what I'm, uh, what I'm getting at here, right? Like the DTD is, it's able to tell you about the entire progenitor population, uh, but we can improve this uh, by doing two things. One is just having a larger, systematic survey of supernova remnants. Uh, and then the other thing is to actually understand the completeness and the visibility time of remnants, okay? So I'm gonna explain the second point a little better first, okay? So 
again, in the DTD equation, you have this visibility time, all right? So this is what you need to convert uh, the right-hand side into a supernova rig. For supernova, this is easy to measure, okay? It's just the amount of time that a supernova is visible. But then remnants, the visibility time is determined by the environment. And the way we pick remnant is quite complex. You know, we take optical line emission and then we look at radio and we look at the spectrum. And then if we have X-ray, we look at that and then we look at hardness ratio. And then there's just a lot going on to confirm a remnant. And trying to measure the visibility time of this kind of a complex selection criteria is just kind of unfeasible. So really the way to do this is to stick to one way. All right. I like radio. Uh, because two reasons. One is that radio samples of remnants are very complete. In the Milky Way, majority of the remnants are detectable in radio, uh, in the LMC, SMT as well. And then uh, the models of radio emission from supernova remnants uh, are, are also, uh, they can be quantified. You know, we have particle acceleration models that show that about 1% energy goes into cosmic rays, about 1% goes into magnetic fields, and you can predict the radio uh, as a, version, as a function of time from that. Uh, so in this 2017 paper, I, I showed that, you know, these models are consistent with observations, or at least you can identify the parameter space where they are consistent. Uh, and then you can convert that into a visibility time estimate as a function of the local density, okay? So this was in M33, and we found that the visibility times are roughly between 20 to 80,000 years. This is uh, consistent with a lot of the estimates of ages you were getting from X-ray binaries today. Uh, and so this is a way to quantify the visibility time in, in our DTD calculation. So in the spirit of actually measuring the DTD going forward, uh, we need a systematic survey of radio supernova remnants. Uh, in the Magellanic Cloud, we have our colleagues in the south, in the southern hemisphere, working with ASCAP. And then in the north, we're doing this giant 1,800-hour uh, VLA survey of all the northern local group galaxies. This is a, a lot of time that we squeezed out of NRAO and they generously donated that. Uh, and so the goal here is to map out all of these galaxies in radio for the first time uh, with high sensitivity from four parsec scales all the way up to 100 parsec scales. And just to give you a little preview, uh, this is uh, uh, an image of M31. Okay, just this uh, few kiloparsec region here. This is the most detailed radio image that uh, you're looking at. Uh, for M31 that has uh, ever been made. Uh, right here, uh, the zoom in section, it shows, you know, there's a lot of objects here. Many of these are previously identified remnants. Uh, there's H2 regions. Uh, this object right here, I'm kind of looking at this. This is really X-ray bright. It's also really bright in dust, which is what you expect in young remnants. And so the goal is to just map out the entire galaxy and just, and just create a large uh, sample of remnants that we can do delay time distributions with. So this is ongoing, keep an eye out for that. Um, and just as a, uh, as a, as a teaser, uh, this is the radial luminosity function of the remnants. Uh, so M31 and M33 uh, are actually very similar in their radial luminosities, and they're, and they're actually fainter than the Magellanic clouds. And this could kind of tie back to what uh, Katie was finding in the Magellanic clouds where the progenitors are, are higher mass. Okay, so if you're higher mass progenitors, you would be going off close to the birth clouds, which are going to be denser, and so you might get more radio. So that could be what's happening here, but uh, we're, we're kind of looking at this in movement. All right, so uh, this is my summary. Uh, I don't know if, if I'm out of time. I'm just going to leave this. Almost. Okay, so uh, yeah, so anyway, again, delay time distribution, it's a very powerful population-based way to study progenitors, and uh, we're doing a lot of survey and a lot of modeling to accomplish that, so stay tuned. Um, so in your radio survey, uh, do you have spectral information on the source? Yeah, or uh, you mean uh, radio spectrum? Radio spectrum. Yeah, yeah, we are. Uh, we're working on that. Um, we're trying this new technique to measure the spectral indices, and that's taking a little time. But it's supposed to give you spectral index at the same resolution as your total intensity map. Um, this is the in band, like, yeah, in this is not in band. This okay. is uh, this is like uh, W projection, uh, oh. mixed with multi multi term, yeah. So, very nice. Comment the question. So, when we talk about 1A, I think 
some of us talk about silicon rich and hydrogen poor objects, and some of us talk about the branch normal harmonic, which I think is like sometimes gets discussion going, even though we both we both agree. Well, you and me, but I mean others. The other thing that I want to ask you is is this um steep slope compatible for one A's? Uh can could this be one slope? I mean, you you, you talk about the delay and the prompt uh, population. Right. Is it possible that this comes from just one distribution? Um, it, I think there was another thought. I mean, just this one will start as well. Was it yeah, this one? Yeah. You, I mean, people always make this distinction, and I never quite understood. Like, is it really that we know that this sort of seems to be two distributions, or could this just be? One steep slope. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know, Carl, if you try to fit well, this. He, one. And I regret putting front and delay in that. And the, the only reason there is a front and delay fit is because there are two. Right? You can call it early and late if you want. But, <laughs> but is it, I mean, do you draw the line arbitrarily or like, I mean, no, we didn't draw the line arbitrarily. The law, the line comes from the underlying star formation history maps that have a certain time resolution. And you have to bin those okay. uh, star formation history maps in order to get so it. this is a bin choice. Then. Exactly. It's I'm sorry, sorry, that's your talk. It's, yeah. it's, it's a bin choice <laughs> and it, it's like it's for a submit advisor's mistake or poor <laughs> choice of words that the brains of his parade right now. Yeah. But this is, I mean. I mean, even in, you know, I mean, Carlson didn't come up with the prompt 1A, like the, the name. I mean, that was kind of, it comes from that A plus B thing yeah. from 2005. And so that that signal is kind of where but this it, signal is. But it's, 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 uh, it's a poor, yes, it's a poor choice of words because it makes people think that there's some kind of bimodality here. Yeah. And that is not true. There is no evidence for bimodality. <laughs> Leave them learn. Thank you. Oh, oh. Uh, one more question. Uh, so you're using the super long range of the super long, right? Yeah. So most type, most uh, core class super long be would uh, uh, occur inside super long. Then they will cannot detect the uh, super long range. They will miss a lot of super long. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've heard that theory floated around. It's a fact. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we like, yeah, but we, if you look at the signal right here, we are calculating this from the supernova remnants and, and the amount of core collapse rate that you are getting from the supernova rate that is consistent with what you predict from for core collapse supernova models. So, I mean, there is a substantial, I mean, so this shows said, that this is big, uh, Cassie, she raised this issue. She said there's a big mystery that there are more more protons than supernova remnants or something. And the fact is that because most of the most supernova explosion will be in that supernova and they are not visible in some way. I mean, so so the so like one BCs, you know, the, the stars coming from 10 million years or 20 million years or younger. Yes, I, I agree that those are those have been seen in H2 regions and bubbles, but like the signal from 20 to 40 million years, those are coming from a lot of red supergiants, which are not necessarily anywhere near, you know, a molecular clouds. Some of them are quite displaced and those produce uh, visible remnants. So yeah, I agree that the 10 million year signal, once we actually get to resolve that, uh, maybe we might see a deficit there because of this incompleteness. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Done for the day. Are there any announcements? Uh, no announcements except take popcorn home if you want and cookies. Thank you, everyone.